this great book of Revelation, the Apostle John was instructed in chapter 1, verse 19, to write, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The visions that John has seen and written down, we also get to see. And we've seen most of them at this point already. Visions of the seals being broken or trumpets sounding or bowls of wrath being poured out. Uh, we see them as we read and as we study this book together. But we have come to understand that these visions are descriptions of our own history. We see through a glass darkly, yes. We don't understand all of the detail of them, but we recognize that these visions are being played out in real time all around us. Throughout our own history, we hear the cry of the martyrs. We see God's judgments. We see evil and wickedness rise. We also see and understand that God's church is being built. God's elect are being gathered. And history is not going round and round in circles. It is going forward to its end point. New Testament history, symbolized by that 1,000 years in the first part of this chapter, is a distinct period of time. Yes, as, a late, as an amillennialist, I hold that it's not a literal 1,000 years, but that number is given because it's large and it's distinct, it's discreet. And so since last Sunday night, we are exactly one week nearer to the end. We're in this millennium. We're here in this history that we've been reading about. The book is all about the things that have been and the things that are and the things which will take place after this. And we're in it. Revelation is pictures. Revelation is moving pictures and sounds and drama. But we are not to think of it as some sort of cinema experience where we sit back and view it but don't really interact at all with it. No, we're in this picture. We're in these visions and the scenes that have already come before us. We're in them. And in this final courtroom scene, well, that is definitely a scene that we will be in. We will see it with our own eyes. Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15, it falls into the category of things which will take place after this. And yet we'll be in it. We don't know when the millennium will end. We don't know if we'll still be alive when Jesus Christ returns to this world. We don't know just how much of the seals and trumpets and bowls we will see in our lifetime. But this final vision of Judgment Day, we will all see it in person. And it is a sobering vision. Just because of that, because we're here. We're in it. All of us. And yes, and all of them out there, driving up and down the road, or walking past, up the street. No thought of God, perhaps, no thought of Christ, no thought of the end. But this is the certain future of every human being who has ever lived. Everyone will see the Lord Jesus Christ seated on his throne. We will stand before him as the judge of all the earth and the judge of all of history. John has also revealed uh, that to us in the very first chapter. Revelation 1 verse 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. All the previous visions have been leading up to this final coming of Christ. Verse 11 uses apocalyptic language to describe what every eye will see. The throne, the face, 
earth and heaven fleeing away, the books opened, the book of life, the lake of fire. All these images, all these pictures are employed so that we may, we might see the, the absolute and the final nature of this day. So we have a number of pictures before us this evening. Our first point is this. It is the picture of the judge with all authority. Verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. This great throne, it is the highest authority. As Jesus said at the end of Matthew's gospel, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. There is no higher court to appeal to. This is a supreme court for all of humanity's history. From this throne, the judge of all the earth will do what is right. There'll be no mistakes. There'll be no miscarriages of justice. There will be no unjust sentences. The throne is white. It depicts the purity of judgment that will issue forth from the judge. The judgments will be righteous and holy and true. They will come from him who sits upon the throne. And that introduces the judge and his judgments as personal. As personal. Perhaps we tend to think mostly of our sins being against the law. Uh, meaning against the moral law of God. Uh, question 14 of the Shorter Catechism. It asks, what is sin? And the answer is, sin is any want of, conformity unto, or transgression of the law of God. That is right. That is true. And yet, sin is more personal than what we imagine. King David, he understood it when he wrote Psalm 51. Verse 4, against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. See, our, our sins are not just transgressions of words written in a statute book, cold. And they're more personal than transgressions of you know, God's words that are written by his own finger upon stone, or even upon our own hearts. Sin is against God personally. Sin is against the triune God, against Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Even our sin as believers, it, it grieves the Holy Spirit. And in particular here, we see that sin is against the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one upon the throne. Jesus said in John 5, verse 22, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. And Paul, he spoke in the Areopagus in, in Athens of this final day of judgment, uh, again saying that it's Jesus who is judge. Acts 17, verse 31. God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Jesus is judge. He is the judge with all authority. And he's also the one whom our sins have offended. Remember when Saul on the road to Tarsus, he was stopped by the blinding glory of Christ. And in Acts 9 verse 4, Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He was taking it personally. And when Jesus spoke at length about the day of judgment in Matthew 25, uh, towards the end of that, he says in verse 45, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Our, our sins, they are against Christ, the judge of all the earth. And here in verse 11, he reveals his face to the world. They have sinned in the face of Jesus. He takes it personally. Those gathered for judgment, they will fear his face. We saw this before in Revelation 6 verse 16. When those who have not come to Christ for forgiveness, 
uh, they cry out to the mountains and to the rocks fall on us hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb the judge who has all authority has a human face and this is good for us to remember for he alone is more than almighty God he is also fully one of us and in this respect he is the one who is beyond reproach in his judgment upon humanity he lived here he was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin and more than that he suffered here as he bore the sins of his people this is I think well uh, portrayed in a scene called the long silence maybe you've read it before maybe come across it in different articles and so on uh, I read it many years ago in a little book by John Benton is Christianity true and he included it in its pages uh, yeah it's not scripture uh, but I think it does just give us a, a little window into the, the perfection of Christ's qualification to judge all the earth. And so I'll, I'll take the time. It only take maybe a, a minute to read. At the end of time, billions of people were seated on a great plain before God's throne. Most shrank back from the brilliant light before them. But some groups near the front talked heatedly, not cringing with cringing shame, but with belligerence. Can God judge us? How can he know about suffering? Snapped a pert young brunette. She ripped open a sleeve to reveal a tattooed number from a Nazi concentration camp. We endured terror, beatings, torture, death. In another gr group, uh, a Negro boy lowered his collar. What about this? He demanded, showing an ugly rope burn. Lynched for no crime but being black. In another crowd, there was a pregnant schoolgirl with sullen eyes. Why should I suffer? She murmured. It wasn't my fault. Far out right across the plain were hundreds of such groups. Each had a complaint against God for the evil and suffering he had permitted in his world. How lucky God was to live in heaven where all was sweetness and light, where there was no weeping or fear or no hunger or hatred. What did God know of all that man had been forced to endure in this world? For God leads a pretty sheltered life, they said. So each of these groups sent forth their leader, chosen because he had suffered the most. A Jew, a Negro, a person from Hiroshima, a horribly deformed arthritic, a thalidomide child. In the center of the vast plain, they consulted with each other. At last, they were ready to present their case. It was rather clever. Before God could be qualified to be their judge, he must endure what they had endured. Their decision was that God should be sentenced to live on earth as a man. Let him be born a Jew. Let the legitimacy of his birth be doubted. Give him a work so difficult that even his own family will think him out of his mind. Let him be betrayed by his closest friends. Let him face false charges. Be tried by a prejudiced jury and convicted by a cowardly judge. Let him be tortured. At the last, let him see what it means to be horribly alone. And let him die, so that there can be no doubt that he died. Let there be a great host of witnesses to verify it. As each leader announced his portion of the sentence, loud murmurs of approval went up from the throng of people assembled. When the last had finished pronouncing sentence, there was a long silence. No one uttered a word. No one moved. For suddenly all knew that God had already served his sentence. You get the picture. The Lord Jesus Christ, he is the judge of all the earth. He's the perfect judge. And he will do what is right. Before his face, both human and divine, uh, the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. See, in this final picture of human history, Christ is all that matters. It's all that matters. Let me ask you.
asking, does he matter to you now, tonight? Does Christ matter? Are, are you ready for this final day? Because the day is coming when everything else will flee away. The things that we run after now, the things that we watch now, the friends perhaps that we run around with now, all of the different things which kind of complicate our lives and all of that, it'll all flee away. Christ is there. 2 Peter 3 verses 10 to 12 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, of which the heavens will be dissolved being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat be ready be ready for that final day because on that day all that matters is the Lord Jesus and all humanity including you and I will stand before him that's really coming into the second picture now that we see. It's the picture of all humanity. Uh, we see it there in verse 12 and verse 13. Verse 12, and I saw the dead small and great standing before God. And then in verse 13, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. The picture is that no one is missing. All who have ever lived will stand before Christ the judge. doesn't matter if you're alive or dead when Christ returns in glory. You'll be there. It, it won't matter if you've been buried or cremated. You'll be there. It won't matter if your body has been you know, carefully and peacefully laid to rest. Or if your body has been vaporized by a terrorist blast. You'll be there. Those lost at sea. Those cryogenically frozen in the hope of future medical advances. Those who have disappeared and their loved ones never knew where their earthly remains are. They'll all be here before the throne. 2 Corinthians 5.10 plainly says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. All will be resurrected on this final day. Uh, we read Daniel 12 verse 2 this morning. Uh, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some to everlasting life. Others to shame and everlasting contempt. New Testament bears the same witness. John 5 verses 28 and 29 where Jesus says. Do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves. Will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Everyone who has ever lived will be there without exception. Adam and Eve, they'll be there. Cain and Abel, they'll be there. Noah will be there. Abraham and Moses and Samuel and David and Isaiah, they'll be there. Herod will be there. Pilate will be there. Judas Iscariot will be there. Presidents will be there. Despots will be there. People who we didn't know at all. They weren't in history books. They'll be there, small and great, before the throne of God. All the faces that you see in the papers or on social media. All the stars, so-called, in this world, as well as all the dropouts. Small and great. And they'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I'll be there. And you'll be there. And then the evidence is presented. Point number three, the picture of all the evidence. In verses 12 and 13, we see that God remembers everything. And books were opened. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Verse 13b. 
and they were judged, each one according to his works. These books, uh, they are opened and read. Uh, some think perhaps there's, you know, there's, there's one book for, for every person, and certainly all of our personal history, it, it's all there recorded in, in, God's, in God's great mind. And here, the books are, are opened and read. All of our life laid bare before the holy throne of God. Jesus spoke of this. Luke chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. He said, For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have spoken in the ear in inner room will be proclaimed on the housetops. You know, we, we sit here in church tonight. This full disclosure, it has not yet happened. I'd be glad of that. You know, we, we chat with one another, we fellowship one another. Uh, we want to have a cup of tea at the end of the service with one another. Uh, we're getting to know one another. But there is more to our lives, isn't there, than what we talk about openly. There always is. We don't reveal everything about ourselves. We don't let everything out. Because not everything is good. But the judge sees everything. And everything is written down. Again, symbolic language, meaning that nothing is overlooked. Nothing is ignored. Nothing is hidden from his sight. Our every thought and word and action is known by the Almighty. Our every sin of omission is noted. There is no lack of evidence when it comes to the convictions here in this court. Consider for a moment the things that you keep hidden. Whether it be thoughts or words or deeds. Things perhaps that, you know, maybe even mum and dad don't know. Perhaps even things that your own husband and wife doesn't know. It's all laid bare before the throne. There is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. All this evidence in its totality, it is the grounds for every conviction. I think we've probably all heard sermons where we've been told that we'll be judged on what we have done with Jesus. And the picture is sort of presented to us that the question from the throne will be, what did you do with my son Jesus? Did you run to him for salvation? Did you trust in him? Did you confess your sin and repent of it and depend on Jesus as your righteousness? Now, it's not wrong to consider the judgment in this way. But scripture is consistent all the way through. We will be judged according to our works. Matthew 16 verse 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he will reward each according to his works. Romans 2 verses 4 to 6. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long suffering? Not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Now, Scripture has no inconsistency between salvation by faith alone in Christ alone and being judged according to our works. And that's because it is our works that reveal our faith in the Lord Jesus. Our, our sins as Christians are just as numerous as those who are not Christians. But what we do with them is entirely different. As God's children, we repent. And we keep repenting. And something amazing happens when we repent. 
according to Acts 3 and verse 19. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. A wonderful verse. Blotted out. Or 1 John 1 verses 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, our works, including our works of confession and repentance, will be revealed on that great and final day. But believer, your works now reveal to your own heart now what you really value now your works reveal to you the allegiance of your own heart and where it truly lies your works tonight reveal whether you actually do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ Right now, your works reveal what's going on inside. Belief and behavior, they go together. The fruit your life produces reveals what kind of tree you really are. Sadly, our works can be very inconsistent with what we profess to believe. But God knows if you're sincere and God knows if you're a pretender like we saw this morning in Luke chapter 20. And the final day will reveal all. All our works will be weighed in the perfect scales of God's holy justice who knows us inside out. And those whose sins are not blotted out, they will be sentenced forever. That's our fourth picture, the picture of the sentence verse 14 and death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and this is eternal hell this is to be shut up with the devil who was cast into hell in verse 10 of this chapter where also the beast and the false prophet were cast in the previous chapter this is to suffer God's holy justice for your own sin forever our sins which we saw as personal against the triune God and sins against the eternal God they will be punished eternally Jesus confirmed it in Matthew 5 verse 46 and these will go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into eternal life again John 3 verse 36 we're told he who believes in the son has everlasting life And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The sentence that God pronounces, it will be right. There is no appeal. There is no early release. No excuses for unbelief will be heard. No pleas for mitigation will be admitted. No argument about not enough evidence will be accepted the judge will pronounce his sentence and it will be righteous and true and binding for all eternity and when you reach that day there is no further opportunity to repent and believe now there is hope for all who repent and believe in the Lord Jesus now And that hope then is seen in this beautiful picture in verses 12 and 15. It's our last point. It's the only picture of hope, and it is the other book. Uh, Verse 12, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. Verse 15, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Moses, Moses knew he was in the book. When he was interceding for the Hebrew people, he prays this in Exodus 32, 32. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. Jesus.
Jesus told the 70 disciples in Luke chapter 10 that their names were in it. Uh, you remember they, they came home from their sort of first mission trip. They'd be going around the towns and villages. They were so excited. They come back to Jesus. Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Uh, and Jesus says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. name in it? Is your name in the book of life? If you could see, you know, the other books, your other book, and everything in it recorded of you, I, I, I do believe you could tell from that if your name was in the book of life as well. If I was to consider, you know, my own book, my own history, and that book opened, it would be exceedingly messy. All my sins recorded. All my thoughts and words and deeds. All my omissions. All my failures to love the Lord my God with heart, soul, mind and strength. It would not be a comfortable read. But thanks to the blood of Jesus, they're blotted out blotted out the book of my life yeah it's a messy book perhaps it's still beautiful in its own way but the book of life it's it's something different it's not about me yes my name is there by God's grace but actually it's about Jesus it's called the Lamb's book of life in Revelation 21 verse 27 yeah, in my books, there's, there's, there's lots of sins, lots of mistakes. Praise God, lots of blots. But the Lamb's book of life is perfect. It's absolutely perfect. Chosen from before the foundation of the world. I don't understand it. My name is there. And if you're a Christian tonight, your name is there too. How can I know for sure, you might ask? And the answer is the gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's the answer. But still, you might say, but how can I know? When I'm presented with this great white throne and the terrors of God's judgment, it's, it's terrifying for my soul. But believer, this throne... This throne upon which your Saviour sits is a throne you know. You've bowed before this throne already. You bow before this throne every day. Everyone who humbles themselves in repentance and faith before the Saviour now in this life, everyone who keeps repenting and coming to the throne, we know this throne. We know it as the throne of grace. The greatness of it. The whiteness of it. We already know these things. And that's why, we're, that's why we're there often. And we're confessing our sins. And we're asking for mercy and, and finding grace. And that grace will be sufficient on the final day. For those who have not come to Christ for salvation, the great white throne will be a final and forever condemnation to eternal hell. But for all those who have come to Christ seeking his forgiveness in this gospel time, that great white throne will be a final and forever confirmation. You belong to the Lamb. You're in his book. If you're a Christian tonight, keep coming to the throne of grace. Keep coming to the throne of grace. Because when you do that, your fears of this throne will give way to thankfulness for all that Christ has done for you at Calvary. If you're not
not yet a Christian, bow now before the great white throne and you will receive mercy and grace and your sins will be blotted out. If you fail to do so now in this time, then that great white throne will prove to be your final and forever condemnation. Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Let's pray, please. Lord God in heaven, we bow before your throne. It is great. It is white. You're absolutely holy and perfect and pure and righteous. Lord, left to ourselves, we are none of those things and we are utterly undone before you. We praise you, Lord God, that we know your throne. Your people know your throne and we love your throne because every time we come before it, we come away having received mercy and grace. And they're the very things that we need and we always need. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll keep us coming. Keep us coming to your throne of grace. Yes, it is great. Yes, it is white. But in this time, there is mercy and grace that covers all our sins. Lord, we pray that we would know your throne well that it would be a place where we gladly bow a place where we gladly gladly kneel day by day by day so that come that final day when we see it in the flesh with our own eyes we will recognize the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus we thank you, Lord, for your book. We thank you, Lord, that our names are written there. So grant us, please, to understand and to know the beauty of your salvation, the wonder of what it is to belong to Jesus, to be written in his book. Lord, help us, please, to understand, to joy in these things, to take comfort in these things, to be rebuked and chastened by these things and Lord please put it in our hearts to make others ready for this final day hear us please for Jesus